Welcome back everyone. It's a long video so I want to jump right in but I just want to say that I've been dooming and glooming because of chapter 137 and 138 but in this last week before the chapter comes out 139 the manga finale I have gotten back on the hope train. I am high on hopium. I am high on copium. I am looking for the Aaron Yeager win. Aaron Yeager stays alive. Now, this isn't a new theory. I first saw it a couple weeks ago, and I'm sure some of you have seen it already. But I want to get into it, give you my opinion. Let's jump right in. There is too much doom and gloom going around when I see people talk about how the story is going to be wrapped up and how Aaron's character will be resolved. Everywhere, people are talking about how Aaron wet the bed for the finale and became a useless plot narrative to make other characters look like heroes. So I'm going to explain why this isn't true, why Aaron's victory has been cemented since chapter 130, and address a lot of counter arguments that I know I'm going to see in the comments. This isn't copium, this isn't hopium, and this isn't some far out theory. This is the truth. I'm explaining the themes and events of the story and how they lead to Aaron's victory being the only plausible one left for the story. And no, Aaron's victory does not hinge on him planning his own death, nor does he want to be killed out of guilt. This is going to be long, like really long. Starting out with what a lot of others have noticed already, the last three chapters look like they're gearing up to be EMA focused chapters, along with wrapping up slash killing side characters. 137, Armin plus Zeke and Levi. 138, Mikasa plus Jean and Connie, and 139, Aaron plus Emir and Historia. This is completely in line with what Isayama said, that this is the story of Aaron, Mikasa, and Armin, and it would be completely fitting for the story to wrap up with those three. As we've seen, chapters 137 and 138 completed Armin and Mikasa's character arcs. Mikasa and Armin's development both needed them to kill Aaron and overcome their dependence on him as the rock, since that's been his role in the trio. So what about Aaron? His development needs him to keep moving forward and survive to see the end of this hell so it's natural that he gets the last chapter focused on him. Does it make sense that he just gets jobbed in the penultimate chapter to make Mikasa's character complete at the expense of the completion of his own? Would this even be a worthy punishment for his sins? Let's assume that the Alliance saves humanity and keeps Paradise safe afterwards because of my peace ending. To die and have his closest friends survive, while also leaving Paradise and Historia's safety secured, all never having to endure the guilt of his actions wouldn't be fitting. No, Aaron dying would be too easy of a way out for him. We already know how he feels, that he would be willing to give up his life if it meant he could change something. Aaron living out the rest of his life in crippling guilt and surviving at the expense of the world and lives of his friends, whom he wanted to protect the most, all to see out his wish for freedom would be too fitting for the tragedy of his character. I know I've lost a lot of doomers at this point who think that Isayama is a dumbass who doesn't care about Aaron's character. To those, I present something Isayama said in an interview in Weekly Shonen Magazine in 2017. What is Isayama Sensei's ideal character like? Isayama, someone who does not lie. From the story's circumstances, to lie means the character twisted his or her original will slash resolve. I find that the most appealing are those who operate according to their resolve, as well as those who, as metafiction would say, rise up against the entire world. On the contrary, I feel that characters that be who become pawns of the storyline are unattractive. Often the main character will give up on their original goals due to story's development, so those who stand opposite of him or her can become more fascinating. The most interesting characters are those who operate according to their resolve, and rise up against the entire world. I wonder who this sounds like. Isayama is basically telling us this. Making Eren a pawn of the storyline, aka a villain whose only purpose is to make the alliance more fascinating, all while giving up on his original motivations, either out of guilt or sense of justice, is extremely unattractive. Now unless you believe that Isayama just loves writing shitty main characters, you have to take his word that Eren is not lying with his motivations. He does in fact want to complete the rumbling and does not want to die. Another interesting tidbit I found was from Yuki Kaji, Eren's Japanese voice actor during a casual radio show. He was very distraught over reading the Tatakai Tatakai scene in the manga, seeing as it has a different and less innocent meaning than it did at the beginning of the story. He contacted Isayama about this who responded with, I'm glad you felt that way. I'm sure there's a reason why you feel that way, Kaji-san. For the final chapter, it'd be wonderful if you convey those same emotions into Eren at that moment. So just in case I need to spell it out, Eren's going to have a Tatakai moment in the last chapter, meaning he certainly isn't dead. From a storytelling perspective, the side that comes out on top from a conflict is almost always the one that expresses the correct ideals. Example, the one that the author wants to portray in their story. Attack on Titan is not an exception to this rule. So with this in mind, what are the goals of the Alliance? Kill Eren, stop the rumbling, save humanity. But are these the themes of the story? Does Isayama want us to show a story about how the saviors of humanity overcome all odds and beat the big baddie in order to save humanity? A lot of people think so, but I'm going to say no. Let me explain by pointing out one of the biggest themes of the story. Children represent the future, and they shouldn't be allowed to inherit the battles of the previous generation. This was spelled out perfectly for us by Mr. Blouse and also by Anya Kupan. In contrast, we've seen how evil it is to force your children to carry on your wars for you through the eyes of Eren, Historia, Zeke, Reiner, and all the warriors for that matter, 
With this in mind, it makes narrative sense that the people who will win are those who adhere to this ideology, and the losers will be the ones who fight against it. See? Warrior parents titanization. If only there was a character fighting in the finale that embodied this ideology. In chapter 130, we get an incredible amount of information from Eren's point of view in the form of flashbacks. From this point on, it should have been clear that Eren was going to succeed. He straight up tells the reader what he wants. Do not allow children to become titanized tools of war just to preserve the island for a little longer. The Alliance simply do not care enough about the dilemma of burdening the future generations. They were upset by the 50-year plan, but in the end they submitted to it. Some other very telling foreshadowing that I haven't seen anyone talk about in Chapter 130, the tragic placement of the last few flashback panels. The juxtaposition of what Aaron wants, for his friends to live long, happy lives, and what is actually pictured, his reaction to Sasha's death, the message is basically screaming at you. Aaron's wish is in conflict with reality. He will not have any of his friends be able to live long, happy lives. Just to throw more salt in the wound, the next panel is an entire page dedicated to seeing all of his friends, minus Astoria, in one of their last happy moments together, with Mikasa's presence being the largest. All, or most, of the people in this final panel are going to die. There are only three left alive anyway, and the one that is going to hit Eren the hardest is Mikasa's death. The price Eren will have to pay for the freedom of Historia and her child will be their lives. There are probably going to be a lot of open-ended or unanswered questions by the end of the manga, but we should at least agree that the biggest problems must be answered. Ymir must be free and paths must end. Titans cannot exist afterwards. The fate of paradise must be addressed. The biggest running problem with the Alliance is that they're ignorant, short-sighted, and unmotivated to solve the bigger problems. They've already explained, through Hanji, that the death of Paradise is inevitable after the rumbling is stopped. They have not once even thought about ending the Titan Curse or freeing Ymir. They don't know all of what we know about Eren, about how he can see the future and how he manipulated Grisha through his memories to take the Founder and give it to him. Having the Alliance get what they want, aka killing Eren, stopping the rumbling and saving humanity, solves exactly none of these problems. For those who think Eren is dead, please tell me this. What is accomplished narratively by his death, besides Mikasa's character development? Does it solve a single problem in the story that needs to be addressed? It should be clear now that Eren, the only one who has shown to have any motivation at all in fixing the way the world is, will be the one to solve these problems. His point of view, and his chapter, has been saved for the very last because of this. It's not a coincidence. Who is the one who's been built up for the entire story to end the Titans once and for all? Reiner? Armin? This should seem like a no-brainer. It would make an ounce of narrative sense for the Alliance to both stop the rumbling and get an added bonus of ending a 2,000-year curse on accident. Eren's POV is still hidden, so it might be the case that he already knows how the curse is going to end, but it can't be revealed to us because it would certainly cement his victory to the reader and would make for a good twist. Assuming these three problems will be solved, let's think about who all is going to win. The answer is Ymir, Historia, and her child. Ymir is going to be freed. She has to. Paths, which she has maintained, won't exist by the end or else the Titans will still exist. The cycle of burdening children with your battles will be over with Historia's child and they will be free. Historia will also not be forced to inherit Titans to maintain the island. Knowing all this, does it make any sense that Alliance will win the end? Are Historia and Ymir on the Alliance's side? This all goes without even mentioning Eren's missing conversation with Historia, which requires his point of view and thus being alive. Which takes me to my next point. As it stands, the remainder of the Eren plus Historia conversation from 130 has been cut. And this is not a coincidence, it is being saved for the last chapter for a reason. With all the similar themes of Eren and Historia surpassing their fathers, not burdening the sins of the current generation onto the next, and just being pro-natalist in general, as well as the timeline matching up perfectly for Eren to be the father, secret meeting 10 months ago, Japanese pregnancies are counted in 10 months, the parallels with Historia equals Emir and Eren equals Devil, I'm just going to concede that Eren is the father. The pregnancy subplot hinges on either Eren or Historia's point of view, and going back to the previous themes of the last three chapters being Eren, Mikasa, Armin oriented, we're almost certainly going to get the resolution in Eren's point of view, meaning that he will be alive to show it. For further thematic proof that I don't see people usually talk about, I'm going to use the words of Kruger to best sum up why Eren will come out the winner. Kruger spells it out for the reader. Your wife, your child, even someone on the street, it does not matter. Love someone inside the walls. If you can't, we're doomed to repeat it all again. The same history, the same mistakes, again and again. This makes it seem like he is talking to Grisha, telling him to love someone in order to break the cycle. But Kruger even goes out of his way to say that, this isn't necessarily for you, someone may see these memories in the future. How could it not be more clear that Kruger wasn't directly addressing Eren, who saw this memory in the future? The pregnancy subplot exists to show how love is the answer to solving the cycle of violence and hatred, and, forgive me for even suggesting this, how Eren and Historia love each other, and through their love, will give birth to a child who is free from the 2,000 year old wars of the past generations. I've made it this far without even touching the biggest elephant in the room, the final nail in the coffin for Eren's possible defeat, that being the final panel. And no, if Sayama didn't change his ending he had planned out from two years ago when it was drawn, it's basically impossible. A lot of people have already talked about this at length. 
how it ties in with the pregnancy subplot, thematic importance of children, parallels to Ymir, and how it just looks and sounds like Aaron. Seriously, the person even uses his pronoun Ome to address the baby. You are free would not make any sense for any other character except Aaron to say. I already know 90% of the counter arguments I'm going to see in the comments, so I'm just going to address them all right here. The Alliance will kill the worm and end the Titan curse, which can also revert the Titanizations at the fort. First, assuming it's even possible for the Alliance to kill the worm, seeing as it didn't even have a scratch on it after being nuked, and assuming that killing it even ends the Titan curse, which we don't know, if the Alliance ended the Titan curse then and there, they wouldn't even be able to return to Paradise since Bird Titan Falco is the only one who can take them there. All life and infrastructure between the Marleyan continent and Paradise has been destroyed. The plane crashed, train tracks gone, and airships destroyed. They'd be royally fucked, stranded in the middle of nowhere. That kind of ending for Alliance is just dumb. I don't think anyone will be coming to save them. Unless you think Hiyomi can magically return to her ruined country in a timely manner and secure an airship to fly across the world to pick them up. Second, Jean and Connie resurrecting would cheapen their deaths, and the Warriors' families coming back would nullify their punishment slash karmic retribution. Another fake out would be bad and cheap. I'll tell you what would be really bad and cheap, leaving the main character's point of view and character missing and incomplete before killing them in a buildup that lasted half a chapter, from Aaron's CT to decapitation. If you're a true Doomer, you've probably already accepted this as the truth, but Isayama has subverted everyone's expectations consistently throughout the entire story, always keeping readers on their toes. Do you think he just stopped because it's the finale? Really? The king of fakeouts won't let us stop guessing and theorizing until the very last page. That's what he wants. Eren is dead. He literally got decapitated. Stop coping. So everyone in the story has died when they look like they were supposed to, right? If that was the case, shouldn't like half the cast have died way earlier? Then Levi, Hanji, Zeke, Armin, Reiner, and Eren twice previously all have those moments of, oh no, they're definitely dead now, they couldn't have survived that. Isayama does this a lot. The splash text said he was dead. Splash texts are often just bait. They are purposely misleading in order to create suspense. I recall the splash page after Levi got blown up had something to the same effect of, sayonara Levi, he's dead now. How is Eren going to survive then? Reiner and Zeke both got capped but survived due to newly introduced and unforeseen logic. Is it really such a stretch to say Isayama will do this for Eren to wrap up the story? It doesn't even have to be a new ass pool. Ymir could rebuild him like Zeke, or he could have put his consciousness in his titan asshole like Reiner. Did anyone think that the worm was going to fart on all the Eldians and turn them into titans? No, this type of logic makes sense when presented, but is really, really unlikely to predict. We're getting a Lelouch ending. Lelouch's chances were dashed with the Eldians at the fort turned into titans. The message of this confrontation was very clear. Even if both sides make progress to find common understanding, they will never achieve peace or equality so long as one side can be turned into titans. It is exactly as Aaron said. The outside world is not wrong for hating them. They are beings who can turn into man-eating monsters at the drop of a hat. I sincerely disagree. It may be rushed, but it seems like this last chapter will be rushed no matter what. But showing the rumbling, restarting, and completing won't even take 10 pages. One page for each of the remaining 4-5 to five continents that haven't been destroyed, and maybe a double spread for the aftermath of the rumbling would be more than enough. A piece ending would need at least two chapters to flesh out even half decently, since things would need to be explained through exposition how bad off the world is, and what the characters are trying to do diplomatically to fix the situation. An open-ending conclusion, where the fate of the world and paradise is left unexplored, is the only other possible ending in the amount of time left. But seeing as how Isayama really wants to explore the theme of breaking the cycle of violence and hatred, leaving it open-ended is highly unlikely. Why did Eren let the Alliance fight back? Why did he let Mikasa decapitate him? Why didn't he use the Warhammer to protect himself? All of these are basically the same question that can be addressed by the same answer. Eren has probably seen something after the rumbling, that scenery, and knows that anything that happens now will not cause him to lose, no matter what. He doesn't want to fight his friends because he loves them so dearly and he wants them to survive, even if he knows they can't. Also, Aaron values freedom so highly it's not implausible to believe that he finds it preferable to die with your convictions than to be powerless and subdued. He knows what it's like to feel too weak and powerless to change anything. Not taking away his friend's power to fight back is in line with his character. The cliff baby will be in the final panel. If you honestly think this, I have no hope for you. Grisha is holding baby Aaron in the final panel. No, baby Aaron is not free and the timeline is fixed. The past cannot be changed. The baby in the final panel has to be Historia's child in order to show how the next generation is free from the 2000 year cycle of hatred. We can get Eren's POV without him being alive. No, not really. The entire purpose of a point of view is to show that the character is experiencing remembering. To my knowledge, a point of view has never happened through a dead person except in 104th Ymir's case, when we got her backstory plus point of view through her letter to Historia. Ymir's letter will be the exceptional case since a letter is a way to show a character's point of view to other characters in the story and thus to the reader. This means they don't need to be alive, so unless you think Aaron wrote a suicide letter, he is still alive. Someone brought up a good point on how we got Grisha's backstory point of view after he was dead. This was done through a combination of Aaron's point of view, because of memory inheritance, and through his books, same as Ymir. So in order for Aaron's point of view to happen in a similar way, someone needs to eat him and then specifically remember the Aaron story conversation. Even if this is silly, I felt the need to include it. The point still stands, he needs to be alive.
The baby daddy is the farmer. Die mad about it. Other people have already so thoroughly thrashed this argument, but I'll summarize anyway. This would be such a monumental disservice to the message of the story and to Historia's character. The farmer being the father would mean that she only got pregnant to postpone being turned into a titan, which we know isn't true. The baby has to be born out of love and not as a tool. And this means that Aaron must be the father, because a no-name, no-face nobody being the answer to one of the biggest remaining mysteries is beyond ridiculous. How will the rumbling restart? Short answer? I don't know. Long answer? Aaron apparently still has the power of the Foundling Titan, seeing as he can 1. create some new colossal titan form after being separated from the worm, and 2. enter into Mikasa's dream after the appearance of titan marks and the bird flying overhead, which has been used multiple times to symbolize his omnipresence. We also know that under no circumstances does Ymir need Aaron to control titans. She saves Zeke this way, commanding a titan to put him in his stomach, and she continued to use puppet shifters against the alliance after Zeke was killed. The fact that the rumbling stopped at all is suspicious, and it's probably part of Aaron Ymir's intentions. So what does Ymir want? We learned a lot about Ymir in chapter 137. She was never trapped in paths. She created and maintained it because she longed for human connection, something that she never experienced while she was alive. Some others have pointed out what she wants from the characters pretty well. She wanted to see true friendship from Armin, love from Mikasa, and freedom from Eren. This is the best theory that is available for us at the moment, considering that we don't have her point of view. I still believe that at the end of the day, though, she is on Eren's side, as Zeke pointed out. Eren understood her, so she went with him. Assuming that this is true, she is going along with Eren and will see it out with him until the end. My theory, after seeing all of these displays of love and friendship, Ymir will decide she wants to live again to experience these things for herself. This will be accomplished through being reborn as Historia's child, whose safety depends on the completion of the rumbling. This means that in order to live a life of love and freedom, she must help Eren complete the rumbling, or else she'll be enslaved to being a tool of warfare in life once again. What about the conversation with Kenny and Yuri talking about how violence brought them together? In my honest opinion, this team has already been verified with the Lion's existence. They were mortal enemies at each other's throats, but came together in response to Eren's violence. However, the result is fleeting in both scenarios. Yuri's peace only added fuel to the cycle of violence, as we saw with the uprising of the Jaegerists, who were victims of Marley and Yuri's ideology of allowing yourself to be unjustly destroyed for the greater good. The Alliance is allowing Paradise to be destroyed in the near future for the same greater good, and thus cannot succeed. Why hasn't Eren's body healed itself if he hasn't lost the will to live? I thought about this one, it may be that he has temporarily lost the will to live, and he's at the point of crisis after approaching the inevitable demise of his friends in the world. I saw another post which was really interesting. It talked about how before Eren met secretly with Astoria, the rumbling was something he had to do in order to protect the island. He didn't really want to do it, but he couldn't accept the alternative. In this sense, it would make a lot of sense how Eren is losing the will to fight. His sense of guilt is outweighing his sense of duty. But after Astoria suggested that she have a child with him, the rumbling no longer became something he had to do, but something that he wanted to do. In this sense, it means that Historia saved Eren again, paralleling how she gave him the will to live in the rice cavern. Eren's development then would involve him, in the last chapter, remembering that he needs to carry out the rumbling to protect his and Historia's child. I think it would be incredibly poetic for Historia to save Eren one last time, and it would be perfect for their characters. It would also make sense with what Kaji said about Eren having one final Tatake moment in the final chapter, but maybe I'm completely wrong and there's another reason why Eren couldn't heal himself. We will find out in a week, but for now, this is my head cannon because it is precious. So to put the theory cleanly, Eren is not going to die for many reasons. He is the only character that has the means and motivations to address all the remaining open plot points. The last three chapters are Eren Mikasa Armin focused, so he must be alive to show his point of view. His death adds basically no value to the story, while being alive is worth far more both thematically and narratively. Isayama said himself that he hates characters who lie about their motivations and become a slave to the plot in order for other characters in the story to shine. Eren's value to the pregnancy subplot basically guarantees his survival, and him being the one in the final panel. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> um, this is the pinnacle of what would honestly give me a 10 out of 10. It solves everything I'm looking for in my ending, which... Honestly, if I had to condense it to one point, is I don't want Aaron's character wasted. Which I felt, the moment he got removed as a point of view from the story, it has been. Um, I have a video where I talk about why Aaron is compelling. Well, not having Aaron in the, you know, the, the story, it, it slowed it down. And I'm sure there's a lot of people feel that way. Honestly, most people seem to be enjoying the Alliance. All power to them. But for me, a true Jaegerist, Aaron winning. And, you know, winning is subjective, right? This is, Aaron, it's not happily ever after for Aaron. You know, he goes back to Historia and the baby. But he killed everybody. He killed his friends, the people he wanted to keep alive most. He is going to be racked with guilt the rest of his life. You know, this isn't necessarily a happy ending. But, to me, it completes Aaron Jaeger's character arc. He had to sacrifice... 
everything to achieve the dream to honestly the goals that were mentioned and break them. The only thing I will say that I see wrong with this theory that potentially it's not as solid as it's been made out to be. In my opinion, one of the points was made where Aaron needs a P- needs to be alive to have a POV. I don't think that's necessarily true when Zeke was dying in the manga um, right after he blew him and Levi up. You know, what happened recently in the anime. He had flashbacks and essentially died. You know, it's like he got brought back to life by Ymir, but he had died and he had his point of view. There is That's not to say we can't have an Aaron POV right now while he's ahead and he's flashing back and we're seeing everything right before he dies, right? He can have a point of view before he dies, dies. You know, before the light goes out in his eyes. So that for me, you know, that's, I don't think that's necessarily a defensible point that you can say Aaron's going to stay alive just because he has to have a point of view. I think that a point of view can be done in many ways, including him being alive in paths, including rewinding a little bit. You know, it's, I, I think um, basing it on the fact that you're not going to read a book or something like Risha's story or a letter or nobody's in the top. I, I, I think that's reaching a little bit to defend it. Um, but everything else is solid. This is this is my hope. This is my dream. This is this this would be perfect. I, I honestly think a lot of people would be surprised. There are a lot of Aaron Mikasa fans, and this is the Eru, Eri, whatever Hisu ending. I I, just, I have gone full Jaegerist by the end of this this last week, this last month. You know, leading up to the finale. Um, I'm all for Flock, Aaron, Historia. I'm all for the Jaegerists. I'm all for j- kill them all. I think it'd be a unique ending. I think it, like, you know, this theory here, it finishes off a lot of narrative elements that have persisted throughout the story. You know, same with the themes. Well, let me know what you guys think. I am looking forward to, I'm sure this is, uh, you know, going to be a controversial video. A lot of people... Have I think accepted Aaron's gonna die or they're full blown alliance supporters? Well, let me know. Thanks for watching. This is a really long video. I'm surprised I could even talk that long. Like, comment, subscribe, comment, share, all the good things, and I'll see you guys next video. Catch y'all later.